Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, we are grateful to the Center for Racial Justice for putting on this event and for all of you for showing up here tonight or this afternoon. And I'm really delighted to have with us Dr. Lerone Martin, who is the uh, Associate Professor of Religious Studies here at Stanford and also the director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. Uh, I first met uh, Dr. Martin when Stanford was heavily recruiting him to join us from Washington University in St. Louis. I actually see at least one of his former students from WashU here in the crowd. <laughs> um, and uh, we are really, uh, I was very personally thrilled that he decided to join us at Stanford. Uh, so Professor Martin's first book, uh, which came out in 2014, was about the religious history of the phonograph and about how African-American ministers teamed up with major phonograph labels in the 20s and 30s uh, to record and sell their sermons and how that shaped African-American Christianity. And now his new book, which I understand just literally came out on Tuesday. Yeah. Um, there are copies here for you, for you to take a look at. And how much are they? Uh, <laughs> I should know that. I do not know that. How much the books cost? I should know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the, the book is just out, and uh, it's from Princeton University Press. And it, it's uh, about the FBI and how, uh, under the 50-year leadership of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI promoted white Christian nationalism, both within the culture of the agency and in society more generally. Um, I had a chance to read it and uh, found it a really fascinating account. I've, uh, in my own work on national security, I've had a chance to read about the FBI, including um, this period of its history, um, but learned a lot uh, from reading this account and all the really rich detail about the FBI's role and J. Edgar Hoover's role in particular um, in bringing FBI agents to religious retreats and all the correspondence that FBI agents had um, or that folks in the community had on questions of Christianity directly with J. Edgar Hoover. So I'm not going to say more, so uh, let Professor Martin uh, do that, um, but just uh, wanted to say that it is a really fascinating and um, engaging read. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Professor Martin will speak for maybe 20 or so minutes, and then I'll uh, engage in a conversation with him for a bit longer, and then turn it over to the audience for, uh, for your questions. So Professor Martin. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for coming. I'll um, start by uh, making a connection between the two books. Um, after I finished uh, the book on the phonograph and thinking about the role of corporations in American religious life, I decided I was going to write a book on radio. Um, and two really important things happened. The first thing that happened was I had lunch with an important colleague of mine at Wash U at the time who was um, writing about um, African American writers. And he wrote a book called FBI's, as in the FBI. And he was telling me that he, a number of African-American writers were followed, harassed, and read by FBI agents. And so he said to me in passing, maybe you should consider doing FBI Freedom of Information Act request on preachers. The second thing that happened uh, two months later was Michael Brown was murdered in St. Louis, where I was living at the time. And I had some ministers who I knew in the community who had said to me prior to the announcement that there would be no charges filed from the um, grand jury for Officer Darren Wilson. Prior to that happening, they had shared with me that FBI agents had reached out to them, to this group of ministers, and asked the question, what are you all going to do to help us to make sure that St. Louis doesn't explode? So it got me thinking how long have FBI agents been reaching out to ministers for assistance? And so I began filing Freedom of Information Act requests about various ministers. And during that time, Billy Graham passed away, the great revivalist Billy Graham. The FBI um, did not respond 
um, according to the statute in 20 days to my request. They rebuffed me. And so I just by happenstance met an attorney and we were talking about what we were working on. Uh, his name is uh, Professor Tuan Samahan at Villanova. And I told him about my situation, you know, and I was like, you know, what, what are you going to do? You know, they're, they're not responding. You know, as my father would say, you know, this is the federal government, right? Like, what are you going to do about the federal government? And so as a good, any good attorney, I suppose, he said, well, what you should do is sue, naturally. Uh, and so I thought, well, I've never thought about suing, you know, the Department of Justice. Um, I'm a historian. I never really thought about that. And he said, I'll, I'll take your case for you. Um, for free, all you have to do is pay the uh, court filing fee. Uh, and so we filed the case in D.C. We thought it would be better to file the case in D.C. as opposed to Missouri. Um, and I went to my provost at Washington University at the time and asked if I could use my research account to pay for the court filing fee. <laughs> to which he told me, I'll get back to you. We've never had this happen before. <laughs> so he checked regulations and said, well, there's nothing really in the faculty handbook that says you can't, so sure. So I filed the case, and from there, I continued to get rebuffed, but the FBI was um, ordered by the judge in DC, who was an Obama, appo Obama appointee, to um, have the FBI release to me on a rolling basis various different things they had on Billy Graham. And most of it, what I received was um, evidence that the FBI was um, fielding death threats against the, the, the revivalist Billy Graham, but also terribly concerned with his whereabouts and constant newspaper clippings of where he was traveling. Um, and then I was told a bunch of other files were either lost or destroyed. So I decided then to file FOIA requests around the world of Billy Graham. So the other organizations that he was a part of, the other groups he was a part of, other ministers that I knew, that, that he knew. And that's what led me to end up writing this book. I discovered what I thought I was going to write was about FBI surveillance, but instead I ended up writing a book about FBI cooperation. And so that's what the book is about. So I tried to, in the book, make three important claims. Um, the first claim that I, I, I make in the book is that J. Edgar Hoover, um, when he remade the FBI, becoming the director in 1924, that he made white Christian nationalism a bedrock of the modern, modern national security state. Um, I do this by talking a brief bit about his upbringing, his childhood. This is a picture of the FBI director when he was 17 years old and a picture of his personal diary. Um, Hoover, as a young man, was um, very much so obsessed with um, being order and structure, and he even taught Sunday school. And as you can see in his teenage diary here at the age of 15, he's talking about teaching Sunday school, preparing his <coughs> lessons, and what all that means. And he often dressed in his cadet uniform pictured here <coughs> to teach Sunday school. And I use this as a metaphor to show how Hoover was terribly concerned with this idea of his FBI being both soldiers and as well as kind of ministers in this way. And so when Hoover took over the FBI in 1924, one of the first things he did was to get rid of all the people of color and women who were um, FBI agents. He hired exclusively white males to be um, special agents. And all of them were Protestant or Catholic, with a few um, Jewish agents as well. But no African Americans and no women were uh, uh, special agents. And part of what he did was he made them sign an FBI pledge for law enforcement agents, which said in part, I shall, as a minister, seek to supply comfort, advice, and aid to those who may be in need of such benefits. As a soldier, I shall wage vigorous warfare against the enemies of my country of its laws and of its principles. So you see the idea of both the minister and the soldier coming into play for J. Edgar Hoover and what it means to be an FBI agent in this country when he took over. So these pledges were signed and in the FBI um, agent's personnel files. And it was something they, were, they signed and they pledged to be committed to, both soldiers and ministers. And one way that Hoover did that was by having his agents go to sp spiritual retreats. This is a file, FBI document from an FBI file where you see that the FBI is having an annual spiritual retreat followed after um, the Catholic Saint, St. Ignatius. And uh, 
uh, retreat, uh, FBI agents were to sign up according to their section, whether they were in identification, administrative division, domestic intelligence, so forth and so on. And FBI agents were encouraged to go on these spiritual retreats where Hoover would have a minister of his choosing preach to his FBI agents about both the importance of their work and how they were not working for the federal government, but they were actually working for God. So this was one way that he was um, cultivating his FBI agents to understand themselves as both spirit, spiritual uh, soldiers as well as ministers to, to the nation. Um, they also, in addition to these spiritual retreats, had FBI mass and communion breakfasts for FBI employees, their relatives and friends. These retreats were done usually in the D.C. area. Um, they were subsidized by federal taxpayers so that the retreats, and, excuse me, so that the breakfasts could be um, held in the, some of the finest hotels in D.C., including the Mayflower. So FBI agents and their relatives and their family and friends could all go, and they would have this uh, mass and also a communion breakfast with a famous speaker. So again, this is just one way within the FBI, Hoover was cultivating a certain idea of a spiritual soldiers and ministers. And all of this, of course, was done with an exclusive white um, um, federal agent staff. By the time African Americans joined the FBI in, the in 1962, and they were pushed by um, uh, Bobby Kennedy, who was the, the Attorney General at the time, even then, after African Americans joined the ranks of spe trained special agents, they were still not invited to these retreats. When I began interviewing um, these men, many of whom were still, are still alive, who were in their 70s and 80s, I asked them about these retreats. Did you go? And one uh, high-ranking FBI official who has since passed away told me that his name was Special Agent Wayne Davis. He told me, he said, we, we, we didn't have those. It's like, you know, I ran the Philadelphia FBI. We didn't have these retreats. And, I was very happy to say, I have the file. Um, I was able to tell an FBI agent I knew something he didn't know. <laughs> um, and so he said, well, let me get back to you. And he came back to me. He said, you know, actually, this did exist, but I was never invited. So these invitations for these retreats were really strictly um, um, relegated to white agents, both prior to the FBI being integrated and even after. I actually finally met an African-American Catholic FBI agent um, who shared with me that he was never invited, but he purposely went anyway as a way just to protest this sort of white religious culture that Hoover had developed within the FBI. Um, this is just a sample of some of the things that Hoover would say at some of these retreats and you'll get in some of these worship services. This is a statement from Hoover at one of their communion breakfasts and mass. And so you'll get a sense of the kind of message Hoover was sending to the agents as a director of the FBI. It is a pleasure to extend best wishes on the occasion of the 15th annual FBI mass and communion breakfast. In this day, when a large number of our citizens are completely engrossed in the material things of life, it is a source of deep pride to know that so many men and women of the FBI, their family and friends, gather each year in this now traditional manifestation of their faith in God. Belief in God and his teachings is vital in the fight we daily wage against the insidious forces seeking to engulf us. Without this belief, crime would soon be rampant. Without it, communistic atheism would rob us of our spiritual existence. Let us mold our lives in his image and likeness and strive to uphold the Christian ideals upon which this great nation was founded. So you see the kind of message that Hoover was saying to his agents, that both that they're working on behalf of God and that America is a Christian nation and uh, their job is to make sure America maintains that sort of commitment to a certain idea of Christianity. This is just a quote that I use in the book. Uh, a retired FBI agent became a minister, and he said, the Bureau was like my seminary. Just to give you an idea of how some agents really felt as if they were trained in theology and religion by being within the FBI. So the second point I make in the book, the second of three points, is that then Hoover and white evangelicals partnered to authenticate and materially support white Christian nationalism. And Hoover did this primarily um, by uh, writing in prominent um, religious periodicals, 
mostly um, Christianity Today, which was at the time a, a new magazine headed by Billy Graham and others to really shape the idea of what evangelical Christianity should be. Hoover did this primarily by having a ghostwriter. Um, this is Special Agent Fern Stukenbroker, who actually received his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. <laughs> And Fern was a short gentleman, but was extremely smart and was skilled at writing. He even wrote for the, for the Washington University and St. Louis newspaper. And so he became an FBI agent and became their top ghost writer. So a great deal of Hoover's writing, including his books, actually were written by someone with a PhD who was trained in European history. And so what Fern Stukenbroker would do is well, he would connect with uh, Christianity Today. They would come up with an idea of something that Hoover would write. He would write it, and then it would be published in Christianity Today. This was one essay that was published, Red Goals and Christian Ideals, written by J. Edgar Hoover, but by his ghostwriter. And what makes this significant is not that just that the FBI director became a prominent author in a conservative uh, Christian uh, uh, magazine, but that the way that these uh, edit, um, articles were then distributed. And I pulled this one on purpose so you could see so the, the, the article was then printed and distributed not only in the Christianity Today newspaper, but also distributed throughout the federal government and throughout the country and throughout FBI field offices with the stamp of the actual United States Department of Justice and the FBI. And so these essays then are more than just somebody's opinion, but they have the stamp of approval of the FBI and the Department of Justice which gives the idea that this is the official United States policy around certain issues. And then these are distributed, again, throughout the country and through FBI field offices as well. And then, of course, they become laundered. I like to use this phrase, laundered, purposely. They become laundered, and ministers begin to preach them in their sermons. Most prominently, Billy Graham began quoting from these articles in his sermons as he traveled around the country and the world including the presidential prayer breakfast, which we've heard a great deal about recently, um, and other sermons, and as well as his radio and television show, The Hour of Decision. But what was fascinating was that the FBI files also were filled with people who would write in and praise these articles. And this is just two examples I'll give. People were writing into the FBI and saying, um, this is a minister. Yesterday morning, I preached on guidelines for a civilization in peril from your essay in Christianity Today. So everyday pastors are now preaching Hoover's sermon, Hoover's articles from the pulpit, which then gives, of course, the idea of what is authentic Christianity and what is the Christianity that is going to keep the nation safe. Other folks wrote into the FBI with things as if our minister always uses a scriptural text, but this Sunday he used Mr. Hoover's article instead. It was an excellent sermon. America should be deeply grateful for a man with such insight and high Christian ideals. So you get the sense in which how people will begin writing in and hearing Hoover's words as being sacred text and being uh, sermons that are preached from across the pulpit. It is not too unlike, I think, our own time where we find some churches where the, pre the former president would have his words spoken from the pulpit or something to that effect. And so these words become sacred in many ways. And finally, um, policing faith. I argue that Hoover and his FBI were adjudicators of evangelical identity and true faith and allegiance. And the FBI did this in a couple different ways. Um, people began writing into the FBI with quotations like this. This is from a letter um, I found in an FBI file um, and Miss Joyce Carter wrote to Hoover, Goldwater, Billy Graham, and everybody are a group that wishes to runs a daily column in newspapers nowadays. So these are really important voices of American conservatism at the time. Christians are getting to the point where they fight amongst themselves so much it's sometimes difficult to know who to believe. There just isn't anyone all different church groups would believe, as well as Republicans or Democrats except the FBI. I don't believe some folks will believe anything unless it's from the FBI. And so this is a section of the book where I talk about how the FBI really became, in this time in American life, in many ways, a spiritual adjudicator, right? This is the clear all. This is the place that's going to adjudicate what is truth, faith, and allegiance. What does that look like? What does citizenship look like? What does safety look like for the country? 
Now, it's hard to believe, but people actually wrote into the FBI for advice, um, spiritual advice. <laughs> Here's a letter from a young man in 1962. Dear Mr. Hoover, I would like any information on the two religious or evangelistic associations. One is the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. The other is the Oral Roberts Crusade. I've heard things about both groups. From what I've heard about you, Mr. Hoover, you are a very religious man. I'm a teenager of 18. I would like any information on these groups or your opinion of them would be appreciated. Thank you for your time and any help you, you, have, you may be able to provide. Yours in Christ. So you see that people, this is one of many letters in the, that I cite that people begin writing in, asking for advice. Now again, this seems very strange to us. None of us would probably write Christopher Ray and ask him for life advice, who's the current director of the FBI. But I think it only shows to the point of which Hoover's um, stature in American life at the time was so large and so, so um, impressive. Um, another way that I put out in the book is a whole chapter dedicated to the FBI's campaign against Martin Luther King Jr. And some of us know a great deal about that. What I ended up stumbling upon was that the FBI actually had an African-American minister as well drafted into that um, campaign against Martin Luther King Jr. This was Elder Lightfoot Solomon Mashal. Um, and he was the first minister that we know of who had his own television show beginning in 1947. He had his own TV show. And he was very uh, anti-communist. Um, he was very much so uh, a conservative. J. Edgar Hoover even wrote him a letter, which I cite in the book, where he tells him, great job. I love watching you on television. And so eventually, they draft this individual into their campaign against Martin Luther King Jr. And so in addition to what the FBI, of course, announced in their famous memo of 1963, Shortly after King gave his I Have a Dream speech, the FBI in his famous memo marked Martin Luther King Jr. as the most dangerous Negro in the country. And so sh shortly after that, they drafted Mashal into a campaign where he would take their information as well as their um, counterintelligence against Martin Luther King Jr. And he would then launder it and put it into his sermons and as well as into his public discourse in order to help to authenticate the FBI's claims that King was not a minister, probably a communist, not to be trusted. And of course, this campaign was typified in the FBI by this um, letter that they wrote him that many of you are familiar with. And this is a, the full letter was um, put in the New York Times several years ago, it was discovered by um, a historian by the name of Beverly Gage. And I won't read this letter because it's very disgusting, but this is a letter the FBI wrote to him as if it was coming from an African-American Christian telling King that he was a fraud and that he should consider um, um, committing suicide. So this was a suicide letter the FBI wrote. So part of this campaign the FBI is doing is saying King is not really a minister and of course using their own ministers to authenticate these claims publicly. Um, and it was effective. Um, the Washington Post ran a poll in 1965 um, asking Americans who do they who do you sympathize with J Edgar Hoover or Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and you see 50% of the country or 50% of the folks who were polled agree uh, sided with uh, J Edgar Hoover as opposed to Martin Luther King Jr. and this is only three months after King of course has won the Nobel Prize but yet still Americans for the most part are siding with J Edgar Hoover as the person who was the real uh, patriot in the country. And then later on, of course, a year later, things are even worse that overwhelmingly two-thirds of Americans, according to the Gallup poll, um, see King as unfavorable. And this is before he came out against the war on Vietnam and when many people really doubted Martin Luther King Jr. But I think this only points to the success of the FBI's campaign against him and of drafting ministers um, to, uh, in that campaign. So in closing, I just want to offer what I think is uh, the legacy, what perhaps is important um, and with all this information. I think it causes us to think about um, FBI personnel. I think how Hoover's legacy within the FBI in some ways has continued. The FBI is still overwhelmingly white and male. Um, there are right now the latest numbers, and these are self-reported numbers in the FBI, but as of December 2022, 5% um, of FBI special agents are African American and 8% are Latinx. So I think what we have is we still have an increasingly diverse country that is being policed at the federal level primarily by a very homogenous group 
And I think this is, has a great deal to do with um, Hoover's legacy within the FBI. The FBI headquarters is still named after J. Edgar Hoover, as many of you know. So I think this speaks a great deal to um, uh, uh, personnel. Um, priorities, I think investigative priorities are still shaped in many ways by Hoover. I think we, there are lots of historical examples I could offer, but I think January 6th is just probably the most pressing in many of our minds. The January 6th report, um, which was primarily focused on Trump, even, had, even admitted that federal law enforcement had multiple streams of intelligence, um, letting them know that January 6th was going to be violent. But um, somehow still, January 6th happened. And I think most of us have probably said in the barbershop, the beauty salon, or at our home, that we imagine January 6th would have probably looked differently had it been people of color, primarily, or Muslim brothers and sisters who were gathering. We all probably think January 6th would have looked very different. I think uh, third, um, I think it relates to politics, not just um, um, speaking about electoral politics, but evangelical politics in this country, about the way that Christian nationalism has reared its ugly head and it's sided with um, a particular form of Christianity and the increasing uh, normalization of the extreme right. I think this has a great deal to do with Hoover's legacy that maybe we can discuss. And finally, um, I think um, the parish or church groups, I think it speaks to church groups who increasingly will probably be confronted by federal law enforcement, whether it relates to immigration issues or if it relates to uh, sanctuary issues that I think this legacy, what the FBI has done in, in, in cooperating with faith communities, I think this form of history can help faith communities to rethink possible collaborations with federal law enforcement and to engage in, with federal law enforcement in a way that is um, more aware. I'll close with a story. During Ferguson, I had the opportunity to talk a great deal with um, Reverend Tracy Blackman, who was um, very prominent there in Ferguson. And she shared with me that the FBI approached her and said, you know, we'd like to know the next time you're going to be meeting with activists in your church. And, um, and she said, well, why would you like to know that? They said, well, we'd like to talk with them. So they asked her, she shared with me, to call a meeting at her church of Black Lives Matter activists and then to, not, to let the FBI know when that meeting was going to be, but not tell the activists so the FBI could just show up. So I think that that just gives this kind of history, lets us know that that's a long running practice and I think it can inform some of our ethical and um, decision making. So thank you, I look forward to the time with questions. So I have uh, a lot of questions about the material you ended with on legacy and bringing the story to the present. Uh, but before we actually go there, uh, I do want to ask you a few follow-up questions on the historical account uh, that you present. And you know, one of the things that actually really fascinated me in reading the book is that you present J. Edgar Hoover as not being a religious purist. So he was eclectic. He drew on Catholic practices and uh, Protestant practices. He aligned with evangelicals, although he didn't identify as a born-again Christian and right. didn't seem to share many of or you know, some of their core beliefs. Um, but he seemed to use religion in a very deliberate way, yes. maybe even more so as a political project. Um, and, and that's actually what I wanted to ask you about. So if he wasn't, if it wasn't just sort of an inherent or only an inherent religious identification, um, but a certain political vision of religion that was most important to him. Yeah, and I, I would say to that that it's for, for Hoover and other Christian nationalists, um, both then and now, is that it's, it's much more important for them to think about this as a worldview. They're not too concerned about theological differences about questions that we would think about with religion in terms of substantive questions like salvation, communion, theology. They're much more concerned about a kind of worldview and orientation. A worldview that says is there's a certain type of uh, social order, a racial hierarchy, uh, a gendered order, a sexual order, sexualized order. And I think for Hoover, that's what he found most important. So he didn't really care if you were Catholic, he didn't really care if you were Protestant. What mattered most is that you believed in the world that he believed in. And one of his agents even quoted and said that J. Edgar Hoover has given us a job, and that is to go out and to create the world that he believes in. 
And I think that that points to your question about how he understands religion and politics. He sees America as a Christian nation, and it is his job to make sure it stays that way. And I want to be clear, as someone who's a Christian, that this is a particular form of Christianity, right, that's very different than the namesake of my professorship, right? Martin King's understanding of Christianity is very different, but I think that in our age today, the loudest form of religion and politics we hear is often on the right and increasingly on the extreme right. And I think a lot of that is shaped by, or is, can be pointed back to Hoover himself and this worldview that finds a racial hierarchy, a gendered hierarchy, as a really, and sexuality. And I know that that's very strange given Hoover's own curious sexuality, but it still points to how he understood um, how the world should operate. And what role was communism or anti-communism in that? Was that sort of the central motivating concern for him politically yes. that led him to embrace this, uh, you know, the, the religious practices and cultivation that he did? Mm -hmm. And that communism in particular is that um, being, he believed that it was atheistic, there's no room for God in communism, and so therefore there's no morality. For Hoover, this understanding is that all morality and governance in America has to come from God. And so if communism removes God from the story, then there's no room for morality or governance or order. But the problem, I think, even further with that with Hoover is that he began to then use communism as a blanket term for anything he saw that was un-American. And so any type of policy difference for Hoover is not simply policy. It's actually gets elevated to the existential realm, right? So you and I don't agree on financial policy. It's probably because you're a communist, right? There's always a conspiracy there that removes the need for dialogue, right? That we can't have a conversation around differing policy points, but it, it escalates everything to the level of existential fight and conspiracy that you're trying to undermine America, for example, even if it's just a simple policy difference. And in thinking about how much that drove what the FBI did, so you know, you've spoken a little bit about the surveillance of Dr. King, and you know, of course that surveillance was not just of Dr. King as an individual, but of the entire civil rights movement, of the That's Black right. Panthers, of the anti-war movement, of anyone who seemed to be challenging right. Hoover's ideal of America, or what it should look like. Um, and you know, what I find interesting about this time period uh, is that it wasn't just the FBI engaged in that sort of suppression of civil rights movements and anti-war protests and the like. So while J. Edgar Hoover dominated the FBI, he was there for 50 years, you know, he had this incredible stature, um, at the same time, you had local police departments yes. and the CIA and other national security agencies yes. sort of engaged in these similar practices. So as you think about what is the role of Hoover as an individual versus something um, that was sort of sweeping society more generally, kind of, how do you sort of pull apart his personal role from something that was more institutional or uh, entrenched? Yeah, well, I, I will add, I think he's important, not just because I wrote a whole book on him, but I think, I think he's important because Hoover does deserve a great deal of credit for modernizing crime fighting. So when the FBI, when Hoover takes over, the FBI, is, is they don't carry uh, guns. They don't have the ability to arrest anyone. And he really brings scientific um, 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 expertise to crime fighting. And I think he's important for that and the development of crime fighting in this country. And then he opens up the National Academy for the training of, of local law enforcement. So local law enforcement then comes to the FBI and learns these new tactics in crime fighting from Hoover himself. And then they're put on the FBI mailing list and receiving all of his mailings, including these homilies that he writes for Christianity Today. So I think he's important in shaping how people think about law enforcement at the federal level, but also at the local level. And then he also wanted complete control of the surveillance apparatus in this country. And so Truman in the 40s separated um, the FBI and made it domestic intelligence and the CIA to be international intelligence. But Hoover, in the beginning, was the end all be all and wanted to have that control in this country. Truman saw that the FBI, he wrote in his diary, was tending toward a Gestapo, is what Truman wrote in his diary about Hoover. So he thought he should split and make the CIA and FBI separate. 
So I think that Hoover is an important site for us to understand how all of this develops and takes shape, both internationally and locally um, through federal law enforcement. And I think to transition, if I could, even today we see about militarized police and a great deal of some of these materials that police receive, whether it's tanks or body armor or weaponry, come from the federal level oftentimes. It's federal surplus, right, that's handed down. I mean, you know this from your own work. So I think that Hoover becomes a really important person for us to think historically about how shaping modern policing at the national level and the local level. And maybe uh, to follow up on that, to take the story into the present. Uh, so Hoover ran the FBI for 50 years from its inception until his death in the early 1970s. Yes. And uh, it's now been another 50 years since his passing. Mm. So when you think about uh, kind of how the FBI has and hasn't changed, you mentioned a little bit already about mm. the lack of racial diversity and the ways in which there are maybe continuing elements of the FBI from this period. Um, but you know, what would you say to someone who might ask, well, you know, this is 50 years ago, it's ancient history. At this point, why should we think that these dynamics are still within the FBI? Yeah, I mean, I think that you know, the fact that his namesake is still the headquarters, I think that that's, I think that's, I think that's an important to note. And you know, in addition to, as you said, the makeup of the bureau, I think its investigative practices still speak to, a, and investigative priorities still speak to um, a, a, a racialized um, 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 agenda. So I'm reminded several years ago that the FBI, it was leaked that they had a, uh, many of you may have saw a memo called Black Identity Extremist. It was a term that was completely made up from the FBI that, and that the quote was, these are individuals who feel that they are being discriminated against, unquote. Therefore, they are perhaps will act um, in, in random acts of violence against law enforcement. And that just was something that we just didn't see in this country. Um, I think the way that um, some of the white Christian nationalist violence has been handled and classified in this country, um, instead of it being seen as a network, people like Dylan Roof and others who have terrorized um, black faith communities and mass shootings are often, despite their Confederate paraphernalia, their Christian nationalist paraphernalia, are constantly classified as lone wolves. I think that's another example of how these priorities are still shaped by race and still shaped by certain Christian ideas and norms. Um, and I think that the way that Black Lives Matter protesters, for example, were, 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 were um, treated and investigated, I think um, that's another example of that the FBI's priorities in many ways and policies are still being shaped by Hoover's legacy today. One of the interesting things about our current political mo moment is that a lot of the criticism of the FBI is now coming from the political right, right? So some of the loudest criticism of the FBI in the last year or so in particular, but actually during the entire Trump administration, was from the former president himself and his political supporters and acolytes. Uh, that has even intensified since the FBI search on Mar-a-Lago last year. So. In some sense, uh, you know, you speak of an alignment between white evangelicals and the FBI. Is that alignment still there, or are we seeing it falter, given the political dynamics of the moment, and particularly around the president, the former president? Yeah, you know, I have a, I have a couple answers for this. I think. I think, you know, one of my students said to me this week. I'm teaching a class for undergraduates this semester. Excuse me. I'm still getting used to this quarter. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on January 6th, and one student, um, Anna, who said to me, she said this quote that she pulled from somewhere, and she said that when you're used to privilege, anything that looks like equality feels like oppression. And it makes me wonder that as conservatives in this country have been accustomed in many ways to um, the FBI being on their side. And now that perhaps the Bureau is slightly more diverse, is slightly more um, um, invested, in, in, invested in investigating white Christian nationalism, I think for some people on the right and the far right, this feels like oppression. 
just because there's been a slight change. I think another metaphor we could use is that if been, you've been used to a tailwind, when that tailwind stops, you know, it feels like you're going into a headwind, but you're not. You just no longer have a tailwind anymore. And I just wonder sometimes if that's what's happening. The other thing I think that's happening for sure, that I'm more sure of, is that as the far right, and by the far right I'm defining as folks who believe that violence is actually on the table to achieve political ends on the right, I think the far right is now increasingly becoming more accepted as the norm on the right. And I think that one thing about Hoover's FBI, even against the Klan, one thing Hoover never, Hoover never stood for, black or white, was for American citizens to in, take, taking the law in their own hands. Now, federal law enforcement could do that. But even for the Klan, he thought that that was a shame and it should never be done. So I think that the FBI still has that stance. And so as the, as the right has become more identified with the far right, it seems to me, and using violence as an option, I think they now find themselves um, in, in the scope of the FBI in a way that the right hasn't. But I think that's more of a testimony to the changing nature of the political right in this country than it does to the changing nature of the FBI. I mean, in a way, what you're saying is that part, elements of the right, or at least the far right, are actually further to the right of J. Edgar Hoover, in that J. Edgar yes. Hoover, um, you, know, you mentioned the Klan. Yes. One of the things that he did do was infiltrate and yes. disrupt the Klan. Yes. So as much as he may have shared some of their ideology, yes. the fact that they engaged in violence that was seen as lawless violence yes. went even beyond his sort of law and order view of the world. Exactly. Um, but that now the open embrace of violence to achieve those same ends yes. um, is actually being normalized. Yes, and I would only add to that that even in his inf infiltrating of the Klan, the kind of, the kind of counterintelligence measures that he used against black activists and activists of color and women still did not compare to the, the, type, of, the type of infiltration he did with the Klan. So the Klan... You know, they would, they would, he would, he would uh, raise up rumors of financial impropriety, um, clan members not living up to their uh, marit marital vows, but that was a child's play for what he did to activists of color and the women, right? Where there was murder involved, there was actual um, um, beating, um, imprisonment, and, and things of that nature. So you're right, but I think it's important to point out that even the way he treated them was still different the severity of the treatment. Right. Um, I think maybe at this point, uh, I might open it up for the audience to, uh, to ask your questions. And uh, I would, Please join me. sorry? Please join me in responding. Oh, please. Please. <laughs> sure. Please. You're you're a guest of honor. Please, please. <laughs> um, and I'll I'll just uh, say that maybe we can allow the students to ask their questions first. I know we have a number of people from the broader community. Thank you as well for showing up to this event. Um, but let's give the the first go at students, and then uh, we'll open it up to just about everyone. Yes. Hey, Kevin. Good old Kevin. What's up, Kevin? Um, <clears throat> so let, let me start off by saying that the cross-dressing portion, that, that, is, that, that evidence is really sketchy. That comes from like one book, Anthony Summers, and um, that, that, that's by hearsay. But it is very clear, A, Hoover never married, never had any children, he lived alone, and he spent the last 40 years of his life spending pretty much every day with his second in charge, Clyde Tolson, who they functioned in many ways as a domestic couple. They vacationed together. The Law Enforcement Museum has Hoover's personal estate. There are pictures there with them together on the beach with their shirts off. They went everywhere together. They ate dinner together every evening. They worked together, they ate lunch together. I mean, in many ways, it was like a really beautiful uh, domestic partnership in many ways. But Hoover would still write for these evangelical magazines about manhood and about masculinity and about how important it was. And he would even give fatherly advice. He wrote this article called If I Had a Son. And 
I think it was still his public utterance of belief in a kind of hyper masculinity that enabled him to still be this, this icon of masculinity, even though he didn't actually probably live it himself. When I've interviewed FBI agents, most of them still were like, oh no, Mr. First of all, they still called him Mr. Hoover. That was that was odd to me, you know. They were like, Mr. Hoover. But many of them say, oh no, he he was he wasn't gay. No, never, never. So th there's still this myth around that. When I wrote the book, what I decided to do was to be descriptive and just describe the relationship as I just did to you, as, a, as opposed to trying to focus on whether or not he and Clyde were ever sexually intimate. I just focused on describing his behavior. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, that's the other side of this kind of extreme right Christian nationalism, is that it's about policing other people's sexuality, even if the proponents, I think, fall short of practicing that themselves. Thank you for the question. This is why we need to do these events before your book is published. <laughs> That's a great point. I think that um, I think we see that a lot in some of the recent court cases in this country about religious freedom becomes much more about practicing my faith and not about other folks' freedom from religion, right? And I think we're seeing that a lot in this court. Um, especially as it relates to this, this idea that somehow Christians are now persecuted or now under attack. And it, 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 it makes me think about a lot of, about some of the court cases that came up in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement where folks were claiming religious freedom and not having to serve people of color. I think it was a Piggy Park Entertainment versus the state of Alabama or something like that. But it reminds me of a great deal of that, about the way that this religious freedom claim is being used as, as, a, as a license to discriminate. And I think that we're seeing that with the Supreme Court today. And there is a sense in which Hoover, I think this legacy can point to that. He certainly um, tried to do his best to tap the Supreme Court of his era um, to get information around cases that were in the docket, cases that were being considered. There's a, um, there's a book called The Cloak and the Gavel that points out about the FBI's wiretapping in relationship to the Supreme Court of, of the day in order to try to figure out what the Supreme Court was dealing with, but also as a way to try to extort Supreme Court justices to try to figure out if there's any, any, any type of material or skeletons in the closet the FBI could use to try to control or influence Supreme Court justices. Um, and I think that we can see a, some of that legacy, I think, today in some ways. Yes? Um, my question I think still is on the ethical coercion. Yes. Um, what about the FBI that created the specific conditions that allowed somebody to be a murderer or to be this kind of institutional drama? It really shaped the institution, it seems like. It's a great question. There's a, there's a new biography of Hoover called G-Man. It's like an 800 page biography. And one of the things that it points out and I agree with is that Hoover was very um, astute at negotiating and navigating bureaucracy. And he grew up in a family full of civil servants. His father was a civil servant. Um, his grandparents were civil servants. So he grew up in the atmosphere of learning how to just engage and work with the federal government. The other thing I would add to that is I think he was 
tremendously smart and making himself useful to presidents. So whether uh, you're talking about FDR, um, Democrat president, and his willingness to wiretap and engage and try to figure out any enemies that were against FDR, to Truman, to Eisenhower, to Johnson, I think he was just really smart at making himself useful to presidents. And forgive the language, um, so I'm glad we're not recording so my mom won't hear me say this, but <laughs> you know, Johnson, President Johnson has one of the most famous quotes about Hoover. When Hoover reached the age of forced retirement from federal service, everyone was forcing, uh, telling Johnson to fire him, and Johnson wouldn't do it. He extended Hoover, um, Hoover's time in office. And he said, quote, I'd rather have him inside the tent pissing out than outside the tent pissing in. So that just gives you an idea, not only of LBJ's flowery language, but also just the idea that the thought that Hoover was this really important person that you wanted to keep on your side because he had just built up years and years and years of surveillance and intelligence on various political figures and made himself very useful to the to presidents of the United States. One of the issues I have is there's a couple liberals during the Hoover era were overwhelmingly anti-communist, and the thing is, no one has written a book about the liberals who had Morris, Ernst, Perry, and Monero Overstreet. Uh, I think I can find a few other things who collaborated with the to sell anti-communism to mainstream liberals. Uh, that book needs to be written about that. Uh, the second thing was, at the time Hoover was writing the articles in Christianity Today, the mainline churches was, even as far back as the 50s, the mainline churches were starting to take on criminal justice issues that were at odds with Hoover. Hoover was praising the Presbyterian Church in the early 50s. The Presbyterian Church was taking liberal stands on criminal justice, which come out against the death penalty. Then, and also you had, you don't know much about it, but in my tradition, the Unitarian Universalist point, there were FBI collaborators who got Steve Richmond fired from his job as editor of the Unitarian magazine, The Christian Register. He pretty much pushed out to a pulpit in the West Coast. Um, and that actually had the support of the American Unitarian leadership. One of my, my theories is that. People who felt they could separate Hoover the cop from Hoover the politician. And secondly, that uh, liberal, liberal anti communism was, well, at all that point. I mean, Ronald Meager was very far removed from creative Hoover's thinking. Uh, New Line Protestant seminaries were very liberal in their teaching, in their teachings on social issues. But I think Hoover was being put forward by some liberals as a modern. Secondly, in the early 60s, Hoover began to distance himself from the far right. Several engaged as a whole chapter. Basically, I mean, uh, the scene was the need to distinguish dissent from disloyalty and the concern about itself. It was very strongly against the John Birch Society, but also against the Christian anti communist state. So, liberal anti communism pretty much died in the late, forever it morphed into neo conservatism. Maybe we can let our speaker respond to that question. Oh, well, I think that, um, thank you for your comment. 
That's one of the reasons why Hoover decided to partner with Christianity Today, because he found Christianity Today to be more of a moderate conservative voice as opposed to the far, far right. Um, several ministers of that era, um, uh, Carl McIntyre and others, were just too far to the right. And I think that the FBI, again, to, to your point about law and order, the FBI saw the far right, John Burke Society and others, as too, willing to go too far, threatening violence, and also um, uh, dwelling in conspiracy theories that there were no evidence for. So the FBI did do its best to separate itself from the far right. And they went on a whole lecture circuit to churches and across the country in the 60s. And the tagline was, the far left is every bit as dangerous as the far right. And so right. that was the way they, right, that was the way they tried to right. maintain their sense. Right, I know we have other questions in the room, so I just want to make sure we have a chance for uh, yes. Professor Martin to finish and then for us to hear from others. Thank you. Please, thank you. No, go ahead. You want to do it? Yes. Oh. Thank you. Um, you produced a work that, that put into uh, a, a puzzle piece that was missing from it. Example, there was the word used in the documents related to Fred Hampton, and the word was black and sight. Yes. Right. So language is where the point, that that's the point of, of the indoctrination point, is language. And that was evidence that she can put that piece into context now for me. Whereas if I didn't hear this lecture, Black Messiah would just, oh, Black Messiah. No, now I have this information that broadens the perspective on how I see him, how he's talking to his race. That's number one. Number two is, did you ever did you ever research Manifest Destiny and the concepts of Manifest Destiny and its progression through time hmm. on how that is directly connected to white nationalism because the context in which uh, uh, Hoover was born Yes. Was an extension of <coughs> Manifest Destiny. It only did, it was created here. In 1846, July 14, Thomas Fallon planted the American flag in the city of San Jose. Peter Burnett was a Catholic. Oh, yeah. And so he's buried in the Catholic cemetery with an obelisk. So there's there's all of these. It's because when you were talking about, when we talk about the language, it parallels clearly with man, the concepts of Manifest Destiny and the burden of the Anglo. Rid the land and what what it actually did because I'm a Native American and Native Eastern Indian from the Sun was the decapitation of the five dollars per head and twenty five cents per scalp. That's what created San Jose County. Mm -hmm. These are these are just facts. And so my question to you is: Well, there's that. Did you did you research that and, and tie that into Hoover? Also, the Chicano movement. That that uh, did you did you make any connection between the way that Cesar Chavez was vilified and the label of the communists, thus activating that piece. Because I think the Chicano move, the Chicano movement, the farm workers movement, and the lowrider movement are kind of excise for this conversation. And I think that there is a proper place for them within the context of white nationalism and the way that it is attacked in our community. And so those are my questions in terms of did you did you factor in the way that the Chicano community it's a great question. I did not, but I will say that you're right about the manifest destiny, or at least the thinking about um, <clears throat> sort of white superiority. Hoover spoke to a group, uh, open up uh, chapter uh, eight in this, with this quote, Hoover spoke to a group of reporters during the civil rights movement in April of 65, and he said, you know, white citizens in this country are, are good, People. They're just afraid about African Americans getting the right to vote and all the freedom African Americans are getting. And African Americans are too lazy, too dumb, and just not ready to, for the vote anyway. Now, he said this in off, off, the, off the record remarks, which were not off the record, but I think it points to your idea about its assumptions about white superiority as it relates to citizenship and voting, for example. I did not connect this at all to the Chicano movement, but I do know about, as the director of the MLK Institute, just about Martin King's letters and support to Cesar Chavez. And I think he's a gr another great example that I could have used in the book because we have someone who's a very much so committed Catholic. But it's a Catholicism that Hoover would not have recognized. It's a Catholicism that Hoover would have seen as probably 
a, a, a ruse for something more nefarious, right? So I think he's would have been another great person that we could have uh, pointed to. And thank you for raising that. Are you an undergraduate or are you a law school student? Wow, future's bright. <laughs> Your first year, Jesus, future's bright. What's your name? Nice, nice to meet you, Isha. How do I see? I mean, part of, part of it, I think, I, I mean this sincerely. Part of it just really starts in your in our own communities, right? Like just locally changing certain types of practices and certain types of norms in the very institutions we find ourselves. I mean, I think. You're right, we still have yet to have uh, a woman be president in this country in the executive branch. Um, I have some of the data here about the latest data of the FBI and, and the gender in the FBI as it relates to women in terms of uh, roles of women in the FBI. I think that, um, especially as it relates to supervisory roles, I think that we have a long way to go, but I think the only way is to really just to keep pushing and to try to change things that are happening in our local community. I try my best as someone who is a man to always, um, always check um, my own commitments and how my own privilege as a man might be uh, shaping some of the selections that I make in my daily life, whether that's students or whether that's um, just in my own leisure time. And I think that's the best way is to try to check our own commitments ourselves in our daily, daily life. And I think eventually those types of ripples, I think, will change. We've already seen a great deal of change as it relates at least to, if we think about gender representation, having a woman vice president. I think no matter how one feels about our politics, right, I mean, that's certainly a change in having a woman in office. And I think that um, engaging in those sorts of practices in our daily lives, I think, shapes and changes the world around us. And I think those ripples will have an effect. I really do. I actually want to just follow up on a piece of that, and then uh, please, I, please. I know there's a, a hand in the back, which I'll come to in just a moment. Um, so there's often a question about how much diversity in these institutions makes a difference. Right. So how much of it is about having a different group of people within Correct. these structures, and how much is about more kind of deeper structural transformation? Yes. So what is your thought on this? And I think Memphis is a great example, right? Tyree Nichols, right? We've got complete African-American police force and you know a citizen was was literally beaten to death I think what it points to is that diversity within our institutions is just that right it's only one step it's not a cure-all right I think that the idea that it, you know that we're just going to change policing for example just if we get more people of color doesn't give any attention to the role that institutions play in shaping behavior so I think just because we have more uh, diversity in certain institutions doesn't necessarily mean those institutions and the cultural practices within them will change. Institutions are big ships, and they turn very slowly. So I think that having diversity in institutions is just one step towards a greater change. I think, unfortunately, it's, it's often used as a shorthand to say, OK, look, we've got more diversity. Everything is better now. I don't think if these numbers, for example, change, the FBI is necessarily going to be um, geared towards forming a more perfect union, to use Obama's language. Um, I think there's a great deal of regulation that has to change the FBI. The FBI still is a hierarchy, it's still an institution that will still have the same investigative priorities no matter who's um, in the FBI. So I think that diversity is just that, it's just one step towards um, a greater change. But I don't think it's the shorthand, you know, the cure all. In the back, thank you.
mean, I think when I was talking about the demographics, I want to be clear that I meant the demographics of the January 6th protesters, that if those folks look differently, I think the federal response would have been different. So I just wanted to clarify that. But I think that there has been efforts in the FBI to recruit at historically black colleges and universities, for example. But um, um, the, there's a um, New York Times um, long form story about um, a gentleman whose name I'm blanking on Terry right now. Terry Aubrey. Thank you, Terry Aubrey, who was an FBI agent, African American FBI agent, who saw what was going on within the FBI and decided to leak materials about the FBI's domestic intelligence programs about how they were targeting people of color and other minority groups, including, including um, Muslim brothers and sisters. And he talked about those efforts in the FBI to recruit at HBCUs, for example, caused a huge firestorm among the, a good portion of the white agents in the FBI who threatened to do a class action lawsuit against the Department of Justice for reverse discrimination. So I think that like that kind of strand of kind of a white supremacist thought, I think, is one example within the culture of the Bureau that still harkens back to parts of J. Edgar Hoover. And I think that the investigative priorities and policies around um, who the FBI investigates points back to Hoover. One example I'll give you is that the, the language of black identity extremists was used, made up, right? No evidence there. We have plenty of evidence of white supremacist violence against communities of color. The FBI refused to use the language around white Christian nationalism. The term they've come up with now is racially motivated violent extremism, as if this is happening equally on all sides. Right? We know in this country that's just not, that's just not happening. The majority of, of hate crimes are happening from white supremacist individuals who are attacking people of color. So I think even the language the FBI uses in its policies right, reflects a certain kind of norms around race in this country that I think need to be changed and in many ways harken back to the architect, of, and that is J. Edgar Hoover, who did receive a number of honorary doctorates. So you can call him Dr. Hoover if you want. Those of us who have PhDs, we feel a little funny about that. But. <laughs> Right. All right. Yep. All right. And I'll right in the back. Um, so coming back to the controversy, yeah. I wanted to ask you about the Supreme Court case that you were discussing and considering how much it changes the right. Yeah, I think, I think, man, you got, you got my back on this one? <laughs> so I think, I think, I, I will say that it is challenging, especially as we think about freedom from religion, right? I think in this country, you know, we've, we've, we've gotten better at, especially, you know, thinking about 1965 Immigration Act in this country, that the religious landscape of this country has changed a great deal. I do think that's true. But I think it's the freedom from religion, those who are atheists and those who are free thinkers, I think they are having a more difficult time because there's still a number of, 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 of a cultural practice and even a legal practice of believing that one can't be moral if one is not a theist of some sort. Think about our courtrooms, right? You know, swearing on a Bible. So I think that we still struggle in this country around freedom from religion. Um, and how to fix that, this is where I'll say that I'm a historian, I deal with the past. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's a question I think that is, is, is huge and multifaceted. Um, and we can talk after, I think, after this. But I think I will, I do agree with you that freedom from religion in this country is very challenging. Um, and I think it, those individual rights, the folks who don't want to practice any type of faith have not been protected and prioritized in this country in the way that they should. I would just add, it's, it was only four years ago that the Supreme Court validated a travel ban motivated, or for which there was a great deal of, it, of evidence that was motivated by uh, religious discrimination. Right. So. Yes, sir.
he, he wrote that he recognized that America, he said, was made up of many religions, but he said America is a Christian nation. That is what Hoover believed. He believed that, you know, that the Ten Commandments were the fundamental um, principles for which democracy was modeled. So he did believe these things, but I don't know if he had anything to do with under God. But I know the Cold War context of America being concerned about the rise of, of a communist bloc did shape this idea of putting under God in the Constitution. And I think you're raising that is so important. A lot of Americans in the general public doesn't thank you the pledge. General public doesn't know that that was inserted in 1954. The story that this country likes to tell itself, especially now, is that it's always been that way. But that's something, as you pointed out, happened in the 50s. And I think this idea of America being a Christian nation um, loses the fact that that narrative typically is something that was happening in the 50s around putting that on the dollar bill and putting that on, in, in, in the Pledge of Allegiance as well. Yeah, I think that, you know, that was always the, the hypocrisy and the irony in this country. So think about Washington, D.C., land of the free, home of the brave, seat of government, and Hoover, that's where Hoover was raised. And, you know, he, he, was, a, he was a teenager when uh, Woodrow Wilson came and, and segregated the entire town. And I think that for Hoover, that just seemed normal, that there was something about people of color, they just weren't quite ready for freedom. They weren't quite ready for it, right? And um, I think that he was raised in that moment of hypocrisy, in that moment of irony, but it seemed normal to him. And that international context played out in DC, and that's the city where he was born, raised, and died. He never lived anywhere else. And DC, the seat of government, I think, points to that really well about the international context. But yet, America's, you know, the, the double V campaign in World War II, you know, victory against fascism abroad and at home, but we all know how that story played out. So I think that Hoover was very much so shaped by this irony that you're pointing to. And he reflected that in his FBI by not hiring African American special agents. Yeah, I mean, he, he's, yeah, he is the state. He's working, he's working for himself and creating the world, he, the way the world thinks. I think, you know, that's the problem with this sort of these, these uh, what religious scholars and English scholars will call like these Jeremiads, these kind of like, America used to be great, we've fallen away, we've got to go back. Like, that's always really great on like, on punditry, but really bad on like historical accuracy. So like, but Hoover would always say America used to be great. But when you ask him, like, when exactly was that, right? It's a very difficult time. We see this in our current day, make America great again. Well, when was America great? Tell us when that was, right? And, and typically when you do, it's not good for people, people of color and women, right? So I think you know, Hoover sees himself as working for returning America to its foundational values and principles. He's not really interested in having sociological conversations around crime. He would write that you know crime is the product of spiritual starvation. That was the, what he used to the, the, he used to write. He wasn't interested in sociological explanations about crime. Well, the problem was America needed to go back to these time cherished principles of the founding, and I think that's what he saw himself as working towards to preserve this nation in the way that it was founded in his mind. And so that callback gives him a clean a whiteboard. It does you know exactly. So everything I'm doing, I'm doing to preserve this country, right? I'm doing because what you're arguing is not American. So I'm going to preserve this country.
There's two things I would say. I think that, 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 that Jeremiah is so attractive, you know, even though it may seem stale, because it's aspirational. Right. It's like we were great once. We can be great again. So that's what makes it so powerful, right? It's aspirational. I think that um, I will quote Martin King here and say, I think America, King would say, America has always had a schizophrenic um, personality as it relates to racial justice in this country. And that America has always made a step forward and then a step or two back. So America's always in these fits, right? So I think that George Floyd and what happened with George Floyd is a moment we saw, and then we're seeing reactions across the country as well. And I think that this anti-woke entire movement in this country is part of a reaction to what some folks saw was ideas of racial equality taking hold in institutions across this country. And I think some people were very upset about that. And I think Martin King would tell us that we should expect that, unfortunately. That if we're going to have progress in this country, we should always expect some type of pushback. Yes, uh, my understanding is that the director of FBI is uh, basically appointed uh, president, correct? Yes, correct. So Hoover served, as, you're right, 1924 to 1972. He died in office. And after Hoover's death, the um, statute is now that the FBI director has a term of 10 years. So every FBI director has a term of 10 years. Um, as we know, James Comey did not make it that far. He was fired by President Trump. Um, and so Christopher Wray is in what, year five, do you know? Something, something like that. So that's one legacy of Hoover that the deaf director has a 10-year appointment now. Do you want to go over to here? Oh, sorry. Here, yeah. And you always said that one of the sources of Hoover's power was that he had files on the president's mission one. Have those ever been found? Uh, did they exist? Have you found them in your FOIA request? <laughs> I mean, there, there are some things, I haven't found anything like that, but there are some things that are, that are known now. For example, was when Hoover was investigating a, a, a mafia boss, he stumbled upon the fact that JFK was having an affair with a mafia boss's mistress. Um, there are reports about him going up to Capitol Hill or having someone go up to Capitol Hill. Uh, at the time, FBI appropriations were to be voted on and simply saying, you know, hey, we, uh, we found this photo of you know, your wife or your child doing X, Y, and Z. Um, someone sent this to us. But we want you to know that we're on it. We're going to take care of it. So that was a way that they would, could extort lawmakers to make sure they would get the vote they needed for FBI appro appropriations, which continued to just balloon throughout, throughout the decades. So the FBI did do things of that nature um, routinely, unfortunately. Um, when Hoover died, his personal secretary, um, um, uh, Helen uh, um, Gandhi began destroying a number of files that were in Hoover's office. And so we'll never know what was in those files. We have some ideas. But he had a file cabinet in his office that, that was locked. It was called personal and confidential. And a number of those files were destroyed by his secretary. And she was ordered to do so in the event of his death. And she carried out her orders very quickly. Kind of part of the talk, it's all right. <laughs>
I mean, I think that, you know, <clears throat> some of this is just Hoover's commitment to white supremacy. Some of it is his um, distrust in American institutions. When um, the Smith Act in this country, which at one point in time had outlawed basically um, being a part of the Communist Party, but also um, advocating the overthrow of the government. As the Smith Act became less and less per, uh, pernicious, so to speak, and not as large, Hoover began to distrust American institutions. So he felt like it was on him and his FBI to engage in counterintelligence tactics, wiretapping, and all sorts of things to protect the country. Couldn't depend on the courts couldn't depend on American institutions and schools and others. So I think he just would have dismissed that as like, you know, King went to one of these liberal institutions that are filling his mind with liberal ideas that are not really Christianity. I think that's how probably how Hoover would have reasoned it. I mean, he just felt like King was either A, being duped into being an, a communist front organization, or B, was actually a committed communist who was working to completely subvert American norms. And I think that that's just, that's just, that's the way that he really viewed King and this way he thought of him. We might There's have a great documentary called MLK FBI. That's on Hulu. So um, if you watch that documentary, it explains a, a, a narrative of the FBI's campaign against King, all that they did. I think we have time for maybe one last question. Translation, are you worried about the feds following you? <laughs> um, so I'll say briefly about my approach, given that I'm first gen, first generation. I did write this book and preaching on wax. I try to write it in a way that my family members who um, didn't have the opportunity to go to college or complete a college degree would be able to read it and understand it. So that was my first commitment to writing in a way. And that's probably, you know, it's, we always want your book reviewed, but you know it's when your family members who are not trained um, in higher education read it and understand it and grasp it. That's always a great honor to me. So that's the first thing. When I finished writing the book, and I had, I, I, I just decided to stop. You know, because I mean, you know this. When you're investigating the FBI, I mean, or investigating state, there's always documents you can get, and you can just find yourself just keep going and going. When I just finally cut myself off and had everything that I thought I needed. I did file a Freedom of Information Act request on myself. It's, it's part of the Freedom of Information Freedom of Information and Privacy Act. So I filed a request on myself to see if the FBI had anything on me. Um, they said they did it. So I didn't know if I was relieved or disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but they said they didn't have anything on me. Um, I did. I, when I teach a class on the FBI and American religion and politics. I usually do invite towards the end of the class. Um, in fact, Naya was in this class with me, Naya Hardaway, who's a student here at the law school. When I taught this class at Wash U, um, I did invite an FBI community liaison person, and they do a, a lecture um, for, for the class. I invited them a, a year in advance. I emailed them, I snail mailed them, um, I, uh, I did everything, and I didn't hear from them for like a year. And out of the blue, they emailed me like, hey, sorry we missed you. You know, well, we'd be happy to come to your class. So I've always believed that was like probably a thorough background check of me and everything of that nature. So when they finally assigned the community liaison to come, um, I was like, OK, well, I'll meet you. He was like, oh, I know where you are. <laughs> I'm familiar. That's what he said to me. So I mean, I've always thought that that was probably a background check and writing this, which, you know, um, you know, 
J. Edgar Hoover would have loved to have cell phones in his day because it would have made his job a hell of a lot easier. So I just feel like I have a cell phone already, and you know I'm not that hard to find, unfortunately. But um, that was my process. I decided to do that at the end, and um, I feel like what I've written, I've tried my best to be honest about the facts and try to also provide a way forward. Um, I think there's a lot of things that need to be changed within our FBI. Um, but I tried to at least to be honest and not just polemical in my claims, but to be historical. And to make an argument about what I think has shaped the Bureau when I think holds the Bureau back from performing the duties that it should form in the country. So thank you for your question. And thank you, everybody, for your time. I really appreciate you all coming. Thank you so much.